I will request all brothers to come close towards the member, please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته respected brothers elders mothers and sisters listening via our audio as well as uh, the video stream all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa taala that Allah subhanahu wa taala allowed us to come to His house. Allowed us after our salah to take part in this gathering. But inshallah, if we sit with a good intention, we sit with passion, we sit with zeal, and sit with an empty heart, not knowing that I have much knowledge, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives knowledge. As the topic for, the, for today is youth and the masjid. We thought it's an ideal opportunity, we've only got, I'm not going to give a date, two months-ish, by looking at me at the back. Um, so we've got a very short time where our masjid will be ready. But I've always, inshallah, but I've always mentioned that the masjid is just a building made out of bricks and mortar and plaster, etc. The most important thing is for us to make the masjid abad. For the masjid to be full of people doing ibadah, praying salah, doing da'wah, teaching and learning, so much other ibadah, that is what makes a masjid. And for that reason, we have not stopped our programs. Even though we've been in a temporary facility, we continue all of our programs. Because if we thought that because we're in a temporary place, we're going to stop programs when we're in the new masjid, then we'll do programs, then that's not the right intention. Wherever we are, Wherever we are, we should be individuals who will try to make change. And for that reason, alhamdulillah, we are very, very honored that we have our respected guest who needs no introduction. The fact that all of our wonderful brothers are here today. Everyone knows the speeches, the talks that our respected guest delivers up and down the country. And during this tour of his, he does not have, our respected guest does not have any programs after Dhuhr. This is the only masjid that our respected guest has 
agreed to deliver a talk after Dhuhr Salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant our respected Shaykh the best of the dunya, him and his family ascendants and descendants, best of the dunya and akhirah. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our guests, inshallah, to benefit each and every single one of us. All brothers are requested to um, listen attentively and make the intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a tawfiq to act upon what has been said. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ma'in. Firstly to all my brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think you can do better than that for Bolton Sharif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, we have a lot of youngsters here who come here to the Masjidi. The masjid is the most beloved of all the places for Allah Azza wa Ahabbul Bilad. It's the most, most beloved of all the places you'll find there the Masjid. And the worst of all places in the hadith says, Abghadul Bilad. So the worst of all places to Allah as well, are the marketplaces. And in today's world, the most visited are the marketplaces. And unfortunately, you know, number-wise, some of the least visited are the masajid. The masajid, the masjids that we've got. Masajid is the plural of, of Masjid in Arabic. The Masajid that you've got, like Monana just said right now, it's not just a building. Unfortunately, most of us, we put our full effort into the decor, the decoration of the Masjid. You know, there's no good Masjid without a chandelier, right? Chandelier has to be the, the final icing on the cake. You know, mashallah, alhamdulillah, you know, at least now we get good copy to pray on. We're not saying anything about that. You get the deck. Okay, have, you know, my, my advice would be keep the design simple. Don't go overboard with making it too much, you know, like too much as in making it too glamorous. Because one of the hadiths of the Prophet وسلم, describing near the end of times is that they will be the masjids will be decorated while the hearts of the musallis will be corrupted so we've got to be careful of that if you look at the prophet ﷺ's time his masjid water was dripping inside the masjid when he used to rain his masjid they had pebbles inside yet subhanallah the sahaba rasulullah the kind of ibadah they did allah mentioned that in the quran you know the munafiqs they built a masjid and it was, Allah named it Masjid al -Dirar. It's the Masjid to harm the Muslims. And then Allah described what a true Masjid should be. Allah said the foundation of a Masjid, La Masjid Ussisa Ala Taqwa. When you've got, you know, normally most of us, when we say the foundation of the Masjid, when we say foundation, what are we talking about? We're talking about the first brick, right? Guys, yes or no? You know, when I, when I do a talk here, I like the people to talk back to me. If you don't talk back to me, then how much yeah? I'm going to have to talk in Gujarati or Urdu. You understand? You're going to have to talk to me. So when I ask you a question, you're going to have to reply to me. So the foundation of a masjid, we think it's the brick. Is that correct? Allah Azza wa Jal said, La masjidun ussisa ala taqwa. The, the masjid that has been founded upon taqwa. Now what is taqwa? Taqwa is the awareness that Allah is watching Allah is watching, Allah is watching, Allah is watching, oh my God, I can't do this. 
You know, like you've got some beef with someone. Do you have? Do you ever have beef with someone? Do you ever have beef with someone? Yeah. Guys, come on. You have beef, yeah? You know what that means, yeah? Maro, maro. The thing is, when you got beef with someone, you want to say something to them, right? And sometimes your anger makes you want to say certain words to them that, you know, say something that's going to hurt him. What's the point of saying nice words? What's the, what's, the, what's the point of saying, you're making me so angry, I think, I think your, your faculties of understanding are not really making a good progress at this time. I mean, what, is that an insult? <laughs> the guy's gonna, is that an insult, right? You want to say something harmful to him, right? The thing is, look, that's, that's, that's where your taqwa has failed. Taqwa is, I've got so much awareness of Allah, I'm tempted to sin, but I can't sin because of that thought in my mind that Allah is watching me. That is what taqwa is. So you know, a whole religion, in every single part of the religion, everything we do, is about taqwa. Like look at Ramadan, Ramadan comes, Ramadan goes, right? Allah says, the whole of 30 days, so that you can build this taqwa mechanism inside you. The most important thing for a Muslim, especially for the youth, is taqwa. And taqwa needs to be my own taqwa. Really, really from inside. It's not like, you know, what other seniors, right? So if you kind of think taqwa is, put a nice probably on, nice white jubba on, mashallah, perfume. <laughs> You know, and then you walk like a buzur looking down, you know. Down the that's, that's just not taqwa because that's your outer. The real taqwa, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in Sahih Hadith Muslim, at taqwa hahuna, at taqwa hahuna, at taqwa hahuna. He said, taqwa is here, taqwa is here, taqwa is here. And he pointed towards his chest. Taqwa is which is in the heart. You know why I'm saying that? Because there's no point of having, you know, even if I come to the masjid, and in the masjid, I'm a good boy, I'm a good lad, I'm a good man. You know, I don't, I don't say anything bad in the masjid. I come in the masjid and say, Kam chubai, kharachwa, good, good, good. And I have my smile in the masjid, I have my, yeah, everything is good. And I go home, and that's where my real self comes out, you know what I'm saying? Ibrahim! Ibrahim! He said Gujarati, is it? Yes. Awijani! Like you get really angry with your, I'm just saying, anger, emotion, whatever, not paying. Sometimes, sometimes you know, you have, you have certain bills to pay in the house, isn't it? Now you've got the electricity bills and gas bills going up, right? Yes or no, guys? Yes. Yeah? Best thing to do is just at that time, just go in Jamaat and Allah's going to sort you out. <laughs> Leave your whole family behind. <laughs> I'm going 40 days. I don't know. And somehow your family struggles behind you to pay the bills. You come back say, Allah na kardiya. Wah, wah. That's not, that's not your responsibility done, brother. Your responsibility is that you pay the bills. Don't wait for somebody else to pay you. You just run off. So when you go home and when you're in the masjid, the real taqwa is, the real taqwa is the heart. What do what I mean? Nighttime, I'm alone. I'm with my phone. Daytime, I was in the masjid. If I open the phone, people, Muslims are watching me what I'm seeing on my phone. So that time you're not going to do, do anything dodgy. But night time I'm alone. I'm in my bedroom. No one's watching me. The only one who's watching me is Allah. Now at that time if my fingers start scrolling to places on the internet and I start watching things or hearing things or looking at things that are haram. That's where my, my, that, that means my taqwa is not there. Real taqwa Rasulullah said is in here, inside here. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he had his masjid, but the men of his masjid Allah described, he said, Fihi rijalun yuhibbuna an yatafaharu. Allah never mentioned that, you know, the whole Quran, yeah? The whole Quran, Masjid al-Nabawi, or the Masjid of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is not mentioned by mortal or bricks. It's not mentioned by them. Masjid, the masjids that are mentioned inside the Quran, even Masjid al-Haram and so on, Allah, Allah actually told off the mushrikeen in Makkah al mukarrama for making the service of the masjid a big thing. Now let me explain this to you because people don't get what a masjid is. Because you know when you come to the masjid, everyone wants to like, you know, right, give, give me this khidmah, give me that khidmah. Look, if you're going to do khidmah in the masjid, you better do it for Allah's sake. 
There's one thing Allah's sake and there's one thing is that I am so and so, I do this for the masjid, I'm going to be known for doing this in the masjid. You, every day you're getting there to do that task in the masjid, but you're doing it because you want people to know who you are. You know what? Your whole life you did that and you got nothing in the end of it. Why? What am I saying? Am I, am I, am I talking nonsense? No, I'm talking from the Quran. Because the, what happened is in Rasulullah's time, Masjid al Haram, the main masjid in Makkah al Mukarramah, around the Kaaba, when the idols were there, the Mushrikeen made, they made their own, uh, they, they, they basically used to give water to the people who used to come to Hajj. And they used to construct the masjid. They used to raise funds for the construction of the masjid and they used to actually help in constructing the Kaaba, maintaining the Kaaba. This is the holiest site on the entire earth. This is before Rasulullah took over Makkah. Have you, got, have you guys understood, yeah? This is early Jahiliyyah day. This is before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left from Medina and before he came back and took over Makkah. So these are the days when they had the idols in front of the Kaaba. And then when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went to Medina as well, one of the things that the, that the Makkah Mushrikeen and the polities said, they said, what? We, we, are the, we are the housekeepers of Allah, Allah's house. Allah's house, we're, the house, we're, we're looking, we're honoring the people who come to Allah's house. And they said, we water, we give water to the people who come to Hajj. Obviously, it's a, it's a massive honor, right? To give water, Zamzam and so on, to the people who come to Hajj. And also to construct the masjid. The whole entire project, every time you needed construction, every fund needed, they were behind it. And Allah said, أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَمِ Allah said, what? You're going to try and equate your watering of the hujjaj and your construction of the masjid with the one who actually believes in Allah? The one who actually, Allah said, إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ Allah said, you want to know who should really construct the masjid? Allah said, يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ the one who believes in Allah, وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَىٰ And he is doing his five daily prayers. وَآتَ الزَّكَاةِ And he's giving his zakat. And Allah says, وَلَمْ يَحْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And that person fears no one except for Allah. That's the real person who's supposed to be behind the masjid. You know, we have nowadays, we have people coming and say, you know, I'm going to give 10,000 pounds to the masjid, make me a committee member. Yeah? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? Yeah. I'll give 10,000 pounds to the masjid, make me a committee member. What does he want to do? He wants to bring inside the masjid something which, which we call politics. You know politics? You know politics? Guys, you know that? You don't know that? Yeah, yeah you must be that good that you don't have any fat politics, huh? huh? Subhanallah. They want to come and become a masjid member because they want to they want to start to throw out their you know their, their weight around in the masjid. La ilaha. Allah said, look, He said, and I'm saying this very clear. I don't look. Monona Sab hasn't you know I haven't had a you know deep conversation. You gave me the topic. I'm going to talk about the topic. After I talk, if you don't like me, then Assalamu alaikum. No problem. You know I'll make dua for you guys. What else can I do? I'm going to say certain things which are on my mind, which I've seen not only, like I've never been to this place. I don't know what's going on here. But I've been up and down the country, I've been, throughout, I've been traveling throughout the world. And it's the same story everywhere, which is what? The people, most of these masjids who run, who the committee members are, they themselves don't have taqwa. Some of them, half the committee members don't do their five daily prayers. And Allah has said in the Quran, Innama ya'muru masajid Allah man amana billahi. The one who believes in Allah, the one who does his five daily prayers, he is the one who's supposed to construct the masjid. So it's all gone wrong from there. Then the next thing they do is, unfortunately, right? And I'm saying this in front of the youth. The reason why I'm saying this is because, look, I'll tell you one thing, yeah? You might think, why am I saying this in front of the youth? Do you realize that one of the biggest problems why the youth don't come to the masjid is because of the elders? I'm telling you straight up, but there's nothing to hide. I don't want these youth to stay behind from the masjid. I'm going to tell you youth to come to the masjid. Why? And I'll tell you, I'll give the, the right prescription because you've got a new building that's starting, all right? And I'll tell you, inshallah, from my little knowledge of traveling across the world, 
what gets it right and what gets it wrong. Number one is, I've got white beard. I don't know how long I've got left. All the churches here that are here with white beards, may Allah bless their lives. Say, Amen. Come on, guys, you've been stingy, my friend. Yeah. Are you waiting for them to get six foot down so you can? Yeah, Amen to go on, yeah. Amen. Because they give a lot of sacrifice. Don't ever forget that. You know, sometimes we kind of say, you know, I don't want to just diss the old generation. The, the old generation, they've given most of the sacrifice, the monies, the donations to, for us to have the masjid. So we have to always recognize that. And we always respect our elders. Okay? Alhamdulillah. Now, I don't know how long I've got. When I've gone to my grave, when all these uncles have gone to their graves, okay? By that time, you young boys, you're going to be in your 30s. You're going to be in your 20s. We don't know when that. You're going to be in the prime age. There's a there's a there's a a writing on the wall they used to have in the Ottoman Empire Masajid in Istanbul in Turkey. There's a writing they used to have at the back of the masjid. They used to have it on the wall. It's not there today. You used to have it now. Just get a hold of this writing. What it says on on the wall. So profound. They wrote on the walls. They said, when you stop hearing the children behind you in Salah, then fear for the next generation. When you stop hearing the children, right? When I say children, I mean this. Imam Taz was leaving prayers. And you've got some young kid that's making a sound. Running around, making a sound, right? I'm going to say to you, Wallahi, by Allah, I take the oath of Allah. If I was in charge of a masjid, I'd be so, I, I, I would actually feel that I'm doing exactly what Rasulullah did if I had those young, 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 youngsters behind me. I'm talking about crying of children. Crying. If you look in the hadith, the Prophet said, he said, I shorten my fart prayers in Jama'ah, basically his prayers is talking about the Jama'ah prayers, because of a few reasons. He said because in one hadith he said because of the the people who are ill who joined the congregation number two because of the one who's got to go to work right and he's talked about because of children or because of basically women who've got children the cries sometimes of children used to be heard in rasulullah's masjid what have we done we've made now posters about not bringing children under seven inside the masjid what so these kids under seven, they can go to Legoland. Yeah? They can go to some black was it black pool, some rides, right? They can go to this and now I will tell you this, right? I don't know if you heard in the news, this was in Texas just one or two months ago. In Texas, in Dallas, they had a and, and again, I know this is on I'm just telling you what happened. I'm not gonna make any comment about it i'm just going to say what actually happened so the pride community right they had a full adult sort of you know trans people men women or trans okay people but they had young children paying their money to see them do certain stuff in that club this was in Dallas, in Texas, protesters came out. It's a big thing, you know, it's a debate going on in America at the moment. I'm not gonna comment on it, all right? Because you know, commenting on these certain things could lead to X, Y, and Z. So I'm not gonna comment, I'm just gonna tell you what actually happened. So what the, what certain people are saying, this is grooming of children, and others are saying this is something else. But anyway, I've just put that in your ear. What I'm trying to say is that these six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, what, they shouldn't come to the masjid? Is that where we're starting off from? Okay, let's talk about after seven. So eight-year-old, nine-year-old comes to the masjid. Tell me, right? Does he feel welcomed? Do we make him feel welcomed? Okay, kids are kids. They run around. They don't sit around on one place for long. It's going to be hard for you to get a kid to just sit there, just look at you like an adult, and you, Hanji, Neji, whatever, for you know half an hour. It's not going to happen. We know it's not going to happen. Okay, kids come with his dad. Kid just happened, your dad's reading the sunnah. Kid runs around, whatever, goes in front of Musallis, you know, 
probably, you know, laughs, probably, you know, with two boys. Sometimes you see this, right? Two boys come together, an eight-year-old, six-year-old, and they come inside the masjid, and this one's, you know, doing something, that one's doing something else, and they're doing it right in front of us as we in the congregation prayer. Are you going to tell them not to come? The best you should do is next time, tell the pr father privately, listen, brother, you know, bring your children to the masjid, but do one thing. Try and stand at the back sofa, the back sofa, or at the side somewhere. So that you know there's no big sort of distraction to the Muslims at the front. That's the best thing. But don't ban them. Don't go angry. You know, the moment you do that, the moment one elderly person has a go at the youth, you know, that's a scar in their mind. Tell me this, tell me one place in the United Kingdom where the kids gonna mess around and their elders are gonna stare at him, give him daggers, shout at him, tell his dad off, tell him off. Where, where, tell me where. Even a library, if a kid goes in a library, wallahi, in a library where Kuffar run that library, where you're not supposed to make a sound. Even if children make a sound there, the librarian will come up to the mother and say, excuse me, if you don't mind, could you please keep silence? Because this is a library. Thank you. Tell me yes or no, guys. Yes, yes. yes or no? Kafir ke baas itna akhlaq hai. Hama sharam ana chan. A non-Muslim has so much akhlaq and good character. We should be ashamed of ourselves. If you're disturbed by a child, there's an etiquette of going to the father or to those like to... Well, you're not going to address the children. Address the parent. Tell him nicely, Zakh Mukhai brother, you know, don't mind, you know. Next time try to, you know, give him give him encouragement to bring his children. Okay, now let's move on. A 10-year-old, 11 year old comes to the masjid. Right? When they come to the masjid, of course you're gonna see them talking now and again. They in, like they come in the masjid, their minds, we have to understand them from their world. Guys, this is not India. This is not India. This is not Pakistan. These kids, you know, by the time they come to the masjid, Fortnite's still running in the head. They got Call of Duty, like shots, kill shots, going in the head. They got FIFA players like, hey, 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 you got Ronaldo, you got Ronaldo, you got Ronaldo. That's their conversation, like their whole head is full of that. Now look, don't, you know, they say a wonderful phrase. Don't see the masjid as your elitist club. But see the masjid as a hospital for those who are ill and need to be cured. Okay? That's what a masjid is. People gotta come from all directions of life with all sorts of things in their heads, in their attitude, in their behavior. Our duty is to welcome them. We're in a hospital. What kind of hospital? Spiritual hospital. Masjid is a spiritual hospital. What do you do in a hospital when someone walks in, you know, A and E, someone walks in with a, with a leg, with, with blood pouring out, what are you going to say to me, hey, hey, get out, what are you doing, you're going to spoil my hospital, get off this place, Wait, go back, Wait. what are you going to do? People will come in the masjid with stress, a lot of people come with stress, with difficulties, with problems, with things in their heads that are not supposed to be there, with the haram content they've seen, they've come to the masjid, they've just sold drugs on the streets. And they come from one Juma somewhere. Like his hair, you know, style, he maybe has got a tattoo. Some of us, our community, we see a tattoo. Man, look this, now get him out of here. He's gonna this he's gonna. Look, guys, take it easy. Understand the understand the kid from where he's come from. Why has he come in a masjid? I mean he's come to the best place he could have come to. I'll give you I'll give you a story. I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories, right? And and you you probably understand that honestly there needs to be a lot of forbearance with these children these are not these are not young abdullah ibn umar abdullah bin abbas from rasulullah's time okay right come to become mufassir of the quran right these are kids of the british streets that have come to our masjid we've got a duty of how we should approach them are you guys with me yes or no half of you said yes the rest of you may allah bless you are you guys with me Yes. Yeah, half of you like me, me is called Maro now. It's called it's a nikar, it's a nikar. <laughs> you know, even when we have a maktab, you know, madrasa inside the masjid, I'm telling you one thing, honestly. You know, for me, one time, I was at one, there was one period of my life when I was much younger with a black beard like Munisa, right? I was like, this is it, these are the rules. 
This is the mother son, this is how it's going to work. Anyone breaks the rules, you get one chance, second chance, third chance, and out the masjid. I've made my fair share of mistakes in life. I'm not going to act in front of you without having made mistakes. So one mistake I made early is, there was a really naughty kid that came to our masjid, who was part of my own maktab system that I had, and he was just messing around, messing around, messing around. And what happened is, I, I gave him chance, second chance, and on the third chance, I really, I really told him, I said, listen, if you mess around again, I'm going to have to, like, when I say mess around, I'm really disrupting the lessons and so on and so forth. And, he, you know, he's trying to become one of the lads. You know, the, you know, the kids here, the boys, they want to prove that they're, they're one of the lads. So he messed around again, and I had to throw him out. So I threw him out the maktab, right? Then a few years later, I used to do, basically, I used to lead the tarawis in that masjid. So one year I led the Taraweez and the, and the committee members said that there's children at the back that are messing around. During our Fard Isha prayer, the first rakat, second rakat, they're like messing around. And I thought, what? So, you know, every time you stand up for a new two rakats, they mess around until the ruku comes and they go into the ruku. You understand? Right? So they catch the ruku, but before that they sit around talking, whatever, you know, having, having their time. So I was like, I made the announcement as well, like, guys, please don't do this. Well. But anyway, it didn't stop. Third or fourth night, I came late for Aisha, so I had to join from the back. So I joined from the back. And as I joined, I noticed the group that were messing around. So I looked at them just before I joined. I looked at these boys. And I told them, obviously, to come forward, like, to join the Salah. But I saw the ring leader, the one right in the middle. The one that, you know, making them, you know, circle around. He was the kid that I kicked out of my maktab. And my heart sunk. And I thought, Ya Allah, what have I done? Like if I had had sabr and patience with him, perhaps I could have turned him into something different. You guys with me? Right? Why, did, why, did, why, why was I so hasty in just throwing him out? Because look, these kids... When they are badmash, you know the word badmash? Five of you like, mm. you use it every day, man, come on. You know the word badmash? You know the naughty kid, yeah? There's a hadith in Hakim al-Tirmidhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's a hadith with a sound chain. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, hyperactivity in children when they're young leads to high intelligence when they're older. When the kid is moving around a lot, kid is naughty, kid is messing around, you've got a born leader in your house. Say, Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah, and also say Astaghfirullah. <laughs> because that kid is going to really be very challenging for you. He's going to be very challenging for you. As a father, as a mother, he's going to give you a lot of... The stronger the leadership in him, the more he's going to give you trouble. And as a ustad, as a teacher in, a, in, a, in the, in the uh, maktab, he's going to give you a lot of trouble. And as, a, as musallis in the masjid, that kid, you know, again, he's going to give you a challenge. Now, Rasulullah said what? He said, hyperactivity amongst children, in, in young children, leads to high intelligence when they grow older. These kids, they're born leaders. I tell you why. To be naughty takes guts. Yes or no, guys? Yeah. To be naughty takes guts. You agree with me? Yeah. All right. To be naughty when you're 20 is easy. Because you're 20, you know, you go to the gym, you know what I'm saying, like, bro? Yeah? You're already, you're already 20, 22, you know, you got your muscles. But to be naughty when you're 8 years old or 6 years old, right? Man, that takes serious guts. I like you young boys, I'm not telling you to be naughty right now, yeah? Okay, so don't get the wrong message. When you see a kid being, like, constantly they're being naughty, what it is is that they've already got a strong heart. They've got a lot of courage. They, now, this is a leader. When a teenager is, is already naughty, Allah has made him a leader. Now, it's your choice. Do you have patience with him, nurture him, and try and make him a leader in Islam? Or do you have, you know, less patience, kick him out, and he's going to become a leader on the streets? You guys understand? 
He's a leader whichever way he goes. He can be a leader of good Muslims or your household or a good son, or he can become a leader in the streets. A lot of these Muslim drug dealers that end up being a drug dealer, I'm telling you, you look at the youth, they're going to be those that were really naughty. What they needed is they needed someone to approach them, understand them. Now let me give you another story. There was a 13 year old that came to my maktab. He came with his hair all the way down there. Right? Now please, don't have wrong attitude with these youngsters who have their hair here and there. Because they're doing it because of their culture. Right? You might have a rule, all right? they're doing it because of the culture, it's different. Like you want the kid to have a hair, certain hairstyle, you gotta get through to him within here first, through to his heart first. If you ever wanna change anyone, look, if you ever wanna change a family member, Right? Like people come up and say, you know, Melissa, you know, I've got I've got someone in my house, you know, my brother or my son or my daughter or my sister, well, they're not listening. But I said, first thing, you know the first thing I say to him? First thing I say, bro, or I say to his sister, I say, don't preach to them do's and don'ts. That's the total wrong thing you are doing. Don't tell them, hey, this is haram, that is haram, do this, do that, why are you doing your prayers? And you're down their throats with akam. These are rulings of Allah. You know the rulings of Allah, you only do them if your belief system is good. Let me give you the example from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi time. Sayyidatina Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, she said, if the hukum and the command of not drinking alcohol, this is a sahih hadith in Bukhari, if the command not to drink alcohol and the command to prohibit zina, prohibit adultery, if that came first in Islam, none of us would have stopped it. None of us would have stopped it. What did they do in Makkah? They worked on their beliefs about Akhirah, about the next world, about Allah, about who Allah is, about the Day of Judgment, about Hasab, Judgment. You're going to be in your grave. You're going to be alone. You're going to stand up. There is real consequences of what you're doing. So you talk, talk about the angels, talk about the world around us, talk about belief system. This is what Allah will do for you. This is what Allah can do. This is what Allah, you know, does do. And so on and so forth. You talk about Allah, 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 Akhirah, Akhirah, Allah, Allah, Akhirah, Akhirah. When that belief system is like, yeah, 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 yeah. And all that. Now this guy is ready to do his salah. If you say to that kid, if you say to one of these kids, hey, go and do it, no, go and do it, and if without the belief system, if the belief system is weak, they might not want to do their prayers. If a person fears, they'll want to do it. Let me give you an example. If this room is dark room, this is a dark room, and there's a snake inside here, and if I say to, and you're inside the room, and I say, hey, get out, there, get out this room, there's a snake in here, it's dark, you can't see anything. Are you going to be just moving? Are you going to be just walking out there? And then you're going to say, what are you talking about? There can't be a snake in here. What do I need to do? I need to switch the light on. If I switch the light on, I don't need to say, bro, get out of here. There's a snake in here. The moment your eyes see the snake, your belief system says, you know what? There is a snake in here. You know the belief, your belief system is, there's a snake here. Once the belief system is there, then automatically that guy's going to run out of the room. Yes or no, guys? How much are you? Yes, then you get proper yes to me. Yes. If, someone, if someone's telling you to stop your car, a car behind you tells you to stop the car, you don't have to stop your car. Who's he to tell me to stop my car? I'm going to carry on driving. But if you see that there's ooh, 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 sirens that come on, and now you believe, oh my God, he was an undercover cop. He just put his siren on top of his car, and now he's put the sirens on. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, guys? I'm going to stop. Unless you're a cracker, but <laughs> right? you're gonna stop because now your belief system is that's the police. You understand? When they hear Allah, 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 to them, just a God. It's like that undercover cop behind you. He's just an individual. But when he puts his siren on his car, suddenly he's like, "Whoa, that's not just a person. That's a copper. That's a policeman. I'm gonna be in serious trouble if I don't stop." So now your belief system changes. You change as well. When you want to change someone in your household, don't just go down ahkam, ahkam, rulings, rulings. Go through the belief system first. Give them talks about the akhirah. Talk about, first talk about positive about Jannah. Now and again mention about hell. Don't go straight into hellfire. Most of us are like, hey, namaz, you don't read your salah, you're going straight to hell. Oh my God. 
What kind of, what kind of way of, you know, I'm telling you, what is this system that we made? You do anything wrong, Jahannam, Jahannam, Azab, fire, this and that. He's going to be well, saying, well, bro, you know, I've done so much bad, yeah? <laughs> I might as well carry on. I've actually heard people saying that. I've messed up so bad, I might as well carry on. I know I'm going to burn in hellfire, I might as well carry on. Look, give them a Jannah. Then be them about Jahannam. Talk about Allah, the good side. About what they might get from Allah. Then talk about some of the bad side. And balance it. Talk about the belief system and then you'll see they'll change anyway. This kid comes in. He's got, you know, he's got, not tattoos, but he comes in. You know, he's got the, his, his trousers halfway down his, uh, his rear. If you know what I'm trying to say, yeah? You can see his, uh, what, do, what do you call these boys? Guys, what do you call these boys? There's a name for it. You know when they walk around and their the trousers are hanging halfway down. I, don't, I know they don't do it these days. Right? I don't see them much, but they used to do it like talking about 15 years back and so on. You got a name for that? What do you call them? Huh? You don't know the child. I know you. You get what I'm trying to say. Right? So he comes in like that. He comes in with jeans and so on. When well, he it's okay to carry on, right? So to carry on, yeah. So so what happens is uh, he comes in and he's got a real attitude. And he's, he's basically having a problem with every teacher. Every teacher's got a problem with it. Anyway, one day what happened is we had a, uh, you know, we used to, we used to have uh, surahs and du'as, okay, inside the maktab. And we used to say whoever has learned the surah and du'a within three weeks, you know, if you, if you spend three weeks or more, then you have to stay behind. If it's two weeks, you can you can go. If it's one week, you can go home. But if it's three weeks or more, we're going to keep you back and we're going to teach you the du'a and surah. Now, we say, we got all the kids together in the hall. We say, okay, who's been on this for, for three weeks or more? Stand up. So certain students stand up. And I'm looking at this kid. His name is Abdul Aziz, right? So I told him, I said, I said uh, Abdul Aziz, how many weeks have you been on this du'a? And imagine Abdul Aziz, uh, imagine I'm sitting there, yeah? And Abdul Aziz got his back behind me. And he's gonna tell me how many weeks, right? He goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me two weeks. And he did it in style as well. He lifted like that, turned around. And... <laughs> now you know what happened, right? He basically saw at me. But he did it in style. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, proper but much. Imam Sako got it. Proper but much. So what I did is I said, Abdulaziz, I said, turn around. So he turned around. I said, Abdulaziz, I think, I said, I think either you think I'm stupid, I never understood what you just did there, right? <laughs> right? Or you actually just, just, you know, just, just meant to really, you know, hurt me. By, by but I said, you know what, I'm not going to react because every teacher gets angry with you and they really want you out of this maktab. I want to sit down with you. So I sat down with him. I took him to the side. I said, don't go to your next lesson. And I started talking to him. I want you to talk to some of these kids who come with broken hearts from broken homes. Then you can see the human inside them. Just for one moment, put all your principles aside. Put all your system aside, your rules aside, mustard etiquettes aside, you know, put everything aside. Look at the human inside him. So what did he tell me? He said, my dad has left the house. He's divorced my mom. Mom, you know, My mom's a single mom. She's struggling to pay the bills, right? They're in a rented apartment. He is, he doesn't know what to do. He's the eldest kid, right? And, and he's stressed out. And he's walking out on the streets because he doesn't know what to do. Right? And that's what made him flip. He got into the wrong crowd and wrong boys and whatever. So then after that, you know, after talking to him for a couple of hours, you know, it takes time for them to open up to you. They won't open up to you straight away. You've got to be really nice to them, friendly. You've got to really show them, I care for you. I really care for you. Just tell me what's wrong with you in your life. He opened up. And then I turned around to my teachers and I said, guess what, guys? I said, Abdul Aziz is going to stay with us however long he stays with us. We're not going to throw him out. I changed my mentality. Not the other kid I got it wrong, right? <laughs> this one, I said, let me get it right. I said, I don't care if Abdul Aziz does his homework. He doesn't do his homework. Well, if he's naughty, we're going we're gonna to be tolerant. And my, my teachers were like, are you serious? I said, yeah, we're going to do that. So we did it for another couple of years. Abdul Aziz still left like more or less the same, the same thing. But you know what you just did? You planted the seed. 
You know who the most of these kids? Don't look at them now. Tell me how many of you elders grew up to a certain age, all of a sudden you remembered when you were 40, when you were 35, you remembered something your mother said when you were young. Guys, put your hands up if that ever happened to you, or your dad, or your dad. If you remember something that you thought, wow, that's true. I remember I'll start telling this. That's the seed. Our job is not to transfer them into what we want them to be known. Our job is to convey the message. That's it. Hidayah, guidance is in Allah's hands. Don't be frustrated with yourself. Oh, I couldn't change that kid. I couldn't change him. He needs to now leave this place and I'm... This. No, you're making a massive mistake. Allah said in the Holy Quran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابُ For you, your duty is to convey the message. For me to judge. Judgment, leave that to me. Whether to send him to hellfire, to Jannah, to excuse him, to do what? Hisab is on my account. You, you just need to convey the message. Allah said, وَمَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ For you, you just need to convey the message clearly. I said, leave the rest to me. Even if you love them, you can't guide them. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ Allah says in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Qasas. You cannot guide whom you love. Your own child, you love him, you can't guide him. You want your child to be a certain way, you cannot guide him. Guidance 100% is in Allah's hands. Our thing is what? To convey the message. So what happened? I dropped the seed in. I didn't see him for years. But one day I go to my local HSBC bank. Now this kid, this kid was a... He was going to fail all his GCSEs, right? He's going to fail. Like the prediction is he's going to fail his GCSEs. Prediction is he's going to go to one of these, you know, some college somewhere. Probably going to fail that. The prediction is he's going to end up either being, you know, some job, right, that nobody wants to do. Or one of these, you know, manual jobs or something like that. Or probably he's going to end up on the streets or he's going to become a criminal. Whatever it is, that's the prediction, right? So, I walk in years later to my HSBC bank. I'm standing in the queue. There's two counters there, there's two guys behind the counters. And I'm waiting for my turn to come, I've got a check to, to deposit. All of a sudden, one of the guys wearing a really smart white shirt, well-dressed, well-dressed, okay? He, he comes outside, he comes outside into the, into the actual bank itself, right? You know, the area from behind the counter, he has to go through a door, right? He goes through that door, closes that door, comes all the way up, up to me, and he shakes my hand and he says to me, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi And I looked at him, right? This is a grown up man, he's about 23 years old. And he hugs me. And I said to him, I said, Abdul Aziz? Like, he's working in a bank. This guy's supposed to rob a bank. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, why is he doing behind the counter? He's working in a bank. And he goes, yes, Ustad, it's me. And I looked at him surprised. And I go, how? He goes, thank you, sir. I go, what? He said, because of the way you treated me, I changed my life. <laughs> That's all they need. They need you to treat them nicely, understand them, see the human inside them. You know, show them, I'm a human inside. I love you for the sake of you being a human. No strings attached. If they get that attention, that understanding, that love, then naughty as it is that, you know what they say to themselves, the seed has been planted. One day that seed is going to grow. And that kid, he said, I did my GCSE properly in the end. I went to a good college. I went to university. I did my accountancy, whatever, whatever. And now I'm working in the bank. He said, Jazakallah. He said, thank you. Thank you for understanding and giving me that time. This is the reality of what we do to kids. It's up to us. You can throw that kid out. You can, you can get angry with him. Look, the masjid, they came to heal themselves. Now do your job as a healer. The best you can do is make them feel comfortable. As an imam, I've seen so many people walk in the masjids. Lie, lie, lie. So many different types of people who walk in the masjids. All types of people. I'll give you another story. All right? There was another kid. Right? This guy was, was Jamal. His name was Jamal. And 
again in my maktab, his, this kid had a record break. And no kid had a record break like this kid for for failing the for failing passing the qaeda. You know the qaeda, the, the book that we have to do the Arabic studies. You know that I'm saying qaeda. I need to explain qaeda. They might think it's al qaeda. <laughs> Guys, hello. I'm not recruiting here. Right? The qaeda is the first book we have in our or in in our Arabic system to learn how to read the Quran. That's all it is. It's alphabetical book. Okay, guys. Okay, take it easy. You're gonna see me, they're gonna think bin Laden too. So this kid, you know, how long does it take to finish the Qaeda? A year, right? Two years, three years max. This kid was on the Qaeda for eight years. Eight years. I would have we wanted to kick him out. I you know, I was so frustrated by the second, third year, like he comes, he comes down again, he comes when he wants to, he comes late. He comes late every day. And I'm like so frustrated. I'm telling him, do your homework, do your homework. He doesn't do his homework, right? He just about receives one letter. Sometimes he reads it right, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he knows it, he knows what it is, but he says it wrong just to, just to make you like, get you wind up. Do you understand? You know, sometimes kids do that. You guys, you guys with it or not? Yes? yes? Sometimes kids know where I do. They just want to like, ah. Oh. That's it. It hurt you, right? It hurt you. I didn't say you right. It hurt you, right? I'm made you frustrated. But anyway, I went to his house. His parents weren't even coming to the to the parents, you know, evening. So I went to his house. When I went to his house, I thought, yeah, Allah, now I understand why this kid is like this. You have to go into their lives. You have to go and see what's in the background. What's going on? You know what, what it is? His father had seven daughters. And then he had one son, this is this guy, Jamal. He was Mr. Prince with a silver spoon born in his mouth. You know what I'm saying? He, when he woke up in the morning, if he said, like in Jannah, we, you know, Allah says, Lakum fiha ma right? You can order whatever you want. If he woke up in the morning and said, Dad, I want that, Dad said, done. Your wish is my command. He had in his house every console game you can say. I think that time was PS, I don't know if it was PS2 or something. But you know, with, with that, you had the Nintendo, this, this. He had every single one. He was the only son. And his dad was like, you know, over the moon. And I thought, Ya Allah. Seven daughters in the house, then he gets a son and basically spoiled him. Then I started talking to the mother and I realized that, you know, my mom's too busy cooking all day. She's cooking all day. And then she just tells Jamal, just go out and play. And then he goes down the streets and he meets his boys and then his mind is just gone. Dad's busy with two businesses. Dad's got two businesses. Dad's got one grocery business, some other business. He just, he hasn't got any time. And I realized that, you know what? Nothing's gonna happen. I came back to my teachers and said, guys, we're gonna keep Jamal. I don't, we don't, I don't care if he learns, he doesn't learn, just keep him. They said, why? I said, I want Jamal to go with two things in his heart. Two things. And listen to this carefully. My mission, I said, my mission is not for him to finish the Quran. This kid's never going to finish the Quran properly with us. But my mission is two things. They said, what? I said, I want him to walk away because our kids used to stay with us till they, till they're 16. I said, I want this kid at the age of 16 to walk away with two loves in his heart. Love for the masjid and love for his teachers. If that is done, our mission is done. Say it again, two loves. What are they? Number one, love for the masjid and love for his teachers. We kept him for eight years. Kid gave us so much trouble. In the end, Jamal's gone. We've planted the seed. I knew we planted the seed. One day after a few years, I'm in the masjid. It's not salat time. Suddenly, someone runs in the masjid. Runs in the masjid. In the Jamaat Khana. I looked at him and he's Jamaat. He's an old, that's an elder teenager, a grown up teenager. I said, Jamaat, what's wrong? He said, Sir, he said, Sir, I got into a fight in the local town. I beat someone up. And the police came. I didn't know where to run to. I thought the best place to run to is the masjid. <laughs> <laughs> job done. 
Job done, right? Guys who listen to the camera, we don't do this thing. We don't do that. This kid just ran in the bus. I thought job done. Imagine that all the places in the world he could have thought of running. He said the safest place for me, the place where I can go and relax. The Imam says there, one of my teachers there, is go to the masjid. So I sat him down, I start talking to him, what's happening, Jama, this and that, right? And then I then I realized after a while, subhanAllah. Okay, he's got his problem, whatever. But you know, he started to come now and again to the masjid. Then what he does is, he, you know, after a few uh, years, another couple of years, I see Jama growing a beard. 19 year old growing a beard. I see him come to the masjid. Now, and then after a little while, he's bringing food for his dad in uh, the in the masjid. Right? And now he's coming to the masjid. No, if I had chased him away, if I had made life difficult for him, he wouldn't be here today. And if you think about it, if I put the love of the masjid, you think about it, in these kids, if they love the masjid, if they came and felt welcomed in the masjid, they will come in the masjid. Now, the same kid guaranteed is not going to run in the masjid when he's 16, 18 years old. He's not going to do that. When they get to a certain age, have you seen 20 year old, 25 year olds come to the masjid? <laughs> Let's run around, kid. Have you ever seen that? Come on, give me time. Yes or no? One. No. He's not going to do it. It's a certain age. They do it. If I'm given the love of the masjid and love of, why do I say love of teachers? Because if he's got a problem one day, he's going to come and discuss it with his imam or teachers, the ones that he actually felt comfortable with. We actually shut their doors down. The moment they do something wrong, you know, you go hard on them. You know what it is? The kid's going to shut down. My, my children, I've done my absolute best to bring them up with them telling the truth, even if they're in trouble, tell the truth. And I'm not going to be hard on them. See, when you go very hard on your kids for telling the truth, you're not going to hear the truth next time. You're going to hear lies. Because kids are going to say, if I say the truth, I'm going to get beaten up. If I say the truth, I'm going to get told of really badly. So they won't tell you the truth. Now, we want them to tell the truth, but we want them to change their behavior also. Now, look, my, my youngest kid now is, is 13 years old, right? Sometimes he hasn't done... No, Alhamdulillah, my, my two other kids, mashallah, you don't have to tell them. They do the salah on time. They'll do the fajr on time. The young one, I still need to, like, you know, I'm working on it. Alhamdulillah, he does his salah, don't get me wrong. But you have to remind him. And when I say remind him, you have to remind him every time, like every other time. Sometimes he's done it. Sometimes, hey, I've done your asr. Uh, asr uh, yeah, I'm going to do it, right? So now the thing is, though, sometimes he hasn't done his salah. And I said to him, have you done your salah? Alhamdulillah, he tells me yes or no. He tells me the truth. I'd rather have him telling me the truth than for him to lie to me. If I went hard on him, if I said, hey, you haven't done your salah, you have come here, blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm doing? I'm shutting him off. He's gonna lie to me next time. But I don't I say, I say, son, you haven't done Islam? Oh, okay, go on quickly, go and do your salah. Go and do your salah. And now and again I give him reminders. I said, better, you know, you're gonna go yourself in the grave, you know that, right? I said, my salah's not gonna help you, you know that, right? My salah's for me, your salah's for you. You sit down with him for a few minutes. Give him that gentle reminder, gentle tucking. And then you see them on the salah again, you know, on properly again. If you want to work with children, you've got to get through to them in their minds. Now, uh, how long have I got? I'm just going. Tor, are, are you guys tired? Is you're tired, then I'm going to end this. That's a few more things I say to you, and then I'll be done. Because I know it's a, it's a Saturday afternoon. Premier League has started as well ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You boys that are supporting football, I'll give you some advice. Alhamdulillah, I've survived a lifetime of cusses. You know when you get cussed? What do you call what do you guys call it up north? When you get dissed. Yeah, yeah. Lifetime of getting dissed, I've, I've survived it. You know how? I never supported a football team. But alhamdulillah, I got the chance to diss everyone else. <laughs> I knew Omar Musallis. No, Musallis, I knew he's a Liverpool supporter. That's why he came to, for, for Salah today. I see them in the mask and say, brother, how you doing? He said, Imam Sad, make dua for Liverpool. I said, oh, no, no, dua for Liverpool. I said, go and make your own du'as, but if you're going to make, look, if you're going to make a du'a, and your du'a is going to be answered, why waste it on Liverpool? Seriously, if you're sporting man you, or you say, hey, Allah's going to accept one of your du'as, why don't you make du'a for your own guidance? Why are you wasting it on, on Liverpool winning some cup, or some man you, whoever they are, right, winning the cup Man City? What's, what's wrong with you? I'll tell, tell them this, but anyway, I know Umar Musallis who supports what, but I'm telling you, we haven't 
If you guys support the team, just, just forget it. Just enjoy the, the sport as a sport, right? You can watch it now and again. But you can be neutral. No one, no one needs to put you in this club or that club. Don't get swayed by that because you know what happens? When your team loses, and they're going to lose 90% of the times. Oh, there's only one cup winner. Yes or no, guys? Uh, how many teams go inside to win that cup to me? Anyone give the number? How many? 20. 20. Uh, and what about the other leagues? How many go inside the other ones? Is it 32 sometimes? Sometimes 32, sometimes 20, right? You've got 1 in 20 chances of winning. 95% chance of losing, 5% chance of winning. So you've got 95% chance of getting this. You don't get dissed just one time. You get dissed on the Saturday. You got text messages coming after they lose. You got WhatsApp coming. You switch your what? You switch your phone off, man. And it's gone bad. Sunday morning they diss you again, right? And then Monday morning your work you've had it. They're gonna diss you there. You get you get dissed three times. And if it's if it's five nil or six nil, you're gonna have to live with that for about two years or three years. Why go through all that trouble anyway? What I wanna say to you is that the masjid you're gonna build, one of the key things you wanna get done. Is because these are the next generation, right? One of the key things you wanna you wanna get done after everything I've just said is that you wanna you wanna make the mas either with the masjid or buy another building have a youth center. I've been telling this all over. Look, youth center. What does it do? It attracts the youth. And when I say youth center, I mean have a nice big one. Don't make a small one. If you're gonna play table tennis, whoever plays table tennis knows that even this length is not enough. You've got the whole table, you've got to stand behind you, you've got to swing the bats, you know. You need some space to move back and to enjoy a good match, right? Have your, have your fold-up tables if you're going to make it fold-up. You can make it a center for hiring for weddings and you can make it a center for a youth club as well. But if you make a youth club, guys, do understand that these youth are going to come in and now and again they're going to damage the, 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 the goods that you've got in there accidentally or they're going to damage it because they're kids if you're going to take membership from everyone fine take some monies and then you raise funds to always replace the tables have a pool table there have table tennis there have foosball there have you know the air hockey there have have football have tournaments bring them in right and with kids right bring you know have these you know we do all of this don't just throw it on your imam side. The Imam is the Imam, he's got a lot of duty. Like, how are you going to run? Let me just tell you this, right? How are you going to run? If you want to run the masjid properly, you know the people who run the masjid, somebody, somebody summed this up really well. Because a lot of our masjids get it wrong. Either you get someone who's too business mentality, business minded, or you get somebody who's too much of a kind of a, you know, buzurg and a spiritual person, and everyone takes advantage of it. So the person phrased it really well. To run a masjid properly, you need to have a person who has the, the mind of a businessman, but the heart of a Sufi. You guys get that? You need to run the masjid like you would run a business. Not making money, not business as in making money, this now, don't mean that. As you know the business principles, you have a corporate way of running things. That guy, you can't do this, I'm sorry, you can't do this. When it's a no, it's a no, you have to have certain rules, you have to have certain things, fine. That's what they do in a corporate world. But you have to have a heart of a Sufi. What I mean by that is heart of a spiritual person. You have to have the gentleness. You have to have the iman, you have to have the taqwa, you have to have the, the, the you know, attachment to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you've got the both combination, must is going to run really good. Now with that, what I'm going to say to you is this, look, today you've got this project, how much is that project today? The project that you do in the masjid, you build, how much is it? 700k. How much have you got left to, to... it's done, yeah? Mash. You guys, take me! Mash. But that's just the beginning, guys. Right? Once you've got your 700k, let me just say, you just spent 700k there. Can you just make sure, please, step by step, if you just follow what I'm trying to say, look, you're going to get loads of money coming for your masjid, and you're going to get loads of the youth coming as well. Let me tell you just step by step how it works. Number one, the imams running everything now. Soon you're going to need two imams. Then you're going to need probably three imams. Give them different, different duties. Don't just think the Imam is just doing his Salah, he's going to do his Salah anyway, we're going to pay him for his Salah. It's not like that. The Imam when he does one Salah, he's doing a lot of things. 
La ilaha illallah. He is now trapped for that salah time. And when that salah time comes, when he leaves it, he's, he's living with like 300 families. Every one of your families at one point is going to come with a problem that you've got and you're going to share it with the Imam. Yes or no, guys? It's on the Imam to keep it confidential. Alhamdulillah. I've had almost every family come up to me and say, this is going in my house, this is that, this is that, and then you have to give them advice. You don't see that. But the, must, the Imam is doing a lot behind the back. Anyway, my point is this. Two or three Imams, whatever, you've got to have a separate amount of money to pay a youth coordinator a youth director someone who's going to look after the youth pay him don't do it voluntarily because what whatever starts ends you know what i'm trying to say the guy comes voluntary today he said for allah for allah's sake i'm coming yeah to do voluntary he's not getting paid he's got bills to pay as well soon he's going to leave it he's going to say for allah's sake i'm going as well do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? You can't keep volunteers for long. The youth coordinates, or the, 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 what do they call them? The youth, um, uh, youth officers, youth coordinators, whatever it is, right? That person gets paid. Let that person look after your youth center. Bring in the games. Bring in the youth. Let them play. For salah time, they have to go to the masjid. They have to pray the salah. After that, before they start the games, give them a five-minute tarbiyah session. Five minutes, quick hadith. Five minutes, then you can play that. Five minutes, something from the Quran. Make that a regular thing. Let them come to you. It's better they come to you than be outside. Now, invest in it. Put, look, you just spent 700K. Allah will soon give you in your banks, He will give you another 500K. He'll give you a million soon. All masjids have got extra, extra amounts in their banks. What did they do? They start buying properties. I don't know why they buy a property. You buy a property because you want to give it for rent. Okay, it's an income for the masjid, but you don't need to. Most of these masjids I know, they've got like one, two, to about five properties. They've got income coming to the masjid. They've got Juma collection on top. They've got enough money there to even open a school, but they don't do it. They don't do anything like that. Now, whether you want to go to open a school or you want to open a school, the main thing is work for your community. Have, serve the people who are of this community. Serve them. Have facilities for them, where they should go. Now, when I say youth, we've got different categories of youth. We've got the young children, we've got those who are teenagers, and we've got those who are in the 20s and 30s. Why should our 20 and 30 year olds be in Shisha, shisha bars? Why should they be there? Find something that's going to attract them to bring them to masjid. Like if they come and they find, but it's, if it's not the, the actual masjid itself, right? You can have other games there that these youth find attractive to come to the, to the masjid. Near the masjid to pray and to play as well at the same time. If you can get the combination right, and if you can spend the money on the right salaries, inshallah, Allah, Allah will make it work. But the most important thing is what? That these youth, they're going to replace me, they're going to replace you. If you don't make it, look, I'm, I'm really fearing for the next generation. You've got this whole metaverse thing that's come out, right? Facebook meta sort of world. Um, right now, we've just got them hooked on to PS5s and your Xboxes and whatnot, right? But you know what? Right now, already, you've got the virtual realities come out. These kids, I really fear for them. By 2030, by 2030, certain countries are trying to, like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has invested, I think, half a billion into a system where they want to have their hotels in Saudi. This is the 2030 vision that they've got, that they want to run their hotels in certain parts with robots. Robots or automated systems. They want to run that. This is Saudi Arabia, guys. And you can imagine, rest of the world if we come to 2030 we've actually got robots working for us if we've got our youth that like they come home and instead of playing on a joystick with their games they're putting a whole you know unit over their heads this is already out this is out today where they can't hear what's going around them they can't see what's going around them and they're locked in again if this becomes something which is the next generation thing Honestly, Ya Allah, I don't know how we're going to bring them to the masjid. 
Guys, we really need to be on the ball. We need to keep these kids with us, understand them, reach out to them. And if you ever come across any of these boys that are early on going off the path, please try and you know get together and understand the reasons why. Don't just go hard on them. This the haram, this and that, kick them out, whatever. Understand the reasons why. Reach out to them deep inside them. Inshallah, if they if you get to the iman side, you can bring them to the you can bring them on the right path. Anyway, I've said what I was gonna say. Jazakumullah khair. Wa akhir da'wan. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. If you're gonna open to any Q and A, we'll have it. Otherwise, we're gonna end it. Inshallah, because I think it's it's good enough. Inshallah. Hmm? Should we, should we ask if there's any questions? So if there's any questions, you can put your hand up now, otherwise we're going to have a short round, we're going to end this. Anyone with any questions on what we've said, what we've mentioned? No? Jazakumullah khair. Okay, we'll make a short round, inshallah, and then we'll end. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa mawlana muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. يا حنان يا منان يا حنان يا منان يا بديع السماوات والأرض يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث يا الله يا حق يا مبين يا أحد من لا أحدنا ويا سند من لا سند له إن قطع الرجاء إلا منك. Oh Allah, we ask you to keep us together as Muslims who love one another. Oh Allah, we ask you to keep us on hidayah, on guidance, on sirat al-mustaqim. Oh Allah, we ask you to keep us on the straight path until we breathe our last. Oh Allah, we ask you to keep our youth. On the Quran, on the Sunnah, on the Sharia, on the way that we have found our pious forefathers. O oh Allah, we ask you to accept the efforts that we are doing. O oh Allah, guide all of us, guide the old, guide the young, guide those who, who need it. O oh Allah, guide us when whether we think we need it or we don't need it. O oh Allah, we ask you to make us of those people who follow the Quran as you have as you have revealed it. And follow the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as he has left it behind. O oh Allah, we ask you to keep the best death to us, the deaths of believers. O oh Allah, keep our souls in the highest abode of Aliyyin when we pass away. And O oh Allah, on the day of judgment, we ask you to bring us in the company of the Prophet. And let us not leave their company until we enter Jannah, Jannah to fill those. O oh Allah, forgive all those who have passed away before us and give shifa and cure to those who are asking for shifa wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in oh Allah we ask you to make the masjid here a successful masjid and make it a masjid founded upon taqwa and oh Allah the best of what I've the things that I've mentioned if it is good for them oh Allah make it happen for them oh Allah we ask you to oh Allah we ask you to make it a masjid that will attract the elderly attract the youth. O Allah, attract those who are coming from far, attract those who are nearby. O Allah, make it a masjid that will be a beacon of light and make it a masjid according to what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left behind. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. MashaAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq to take from the pearls and diamonds that the Shaykh has delivered. And we hope, inshaAllah, once our masjid is built, we hope to have Shaykh here once again to remind us once again of these points. But amazing, wonderful points. And this was something which is probably in everyone's hearts. And they came onto the blessed lips of our respected Shaykh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the best, him and his family, the best of the dunya and the best of the akhirah.
Uh, so stop it. I don't set this. Why are you stop it? You just press X. Right here. Yeah, just press X. Uh, yeah, stop streaming.